Welcome to the Electronics Basics series. Make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon to get notifications. I'm doing a video every day, so make sure you come back again tomorrow. In today's video, I'm going to talk about linear power supplies. Now, the last video I talked about linear voltage regulators. Now, I didn't actually specify what I mean by linear, and that means it's not a switch mode. Basically, it means it's going through a device, dropping down, and continuously being dropped, right? So it's not actually switching on and off and pulsed like it is on a switch mode power supply, a consistent level, there's no switching involved. Now the advantage of linear stuff is that it's quieter, there's less electrical noise on the power supply lines and even transmitted into the environment. Switch mode power supplies emit noise, electrical noise, and EMI interference and stuff like that. A great example is on these LED lights up here. I've got a switch mode power supply running some of these lights and they can actually emit noise. So if I'm trying to do a precise measurement with a very low voltage, precision measurement on an oscilloscope, sometimes I turn the lights off because the switch mode power supply puts out just enough noise sometimes to affect the readings, which is the thing you don't have with linear power supplies because they are much cleaner. You still get 50 hertz noise or 100 hertz noise or 60, 120 hertz noise, depending on which country you're in, but they are much cleaner. So they're actually a preference, like if you're trying to look for a power supply to buy it to use in your lab, or you know, when you're doing your hobbyist and you're learning electronics and you need a power supply, if you can, if your budget can stretch to it, get a linear power supply, not a switch mode, because there's advantages to that. Main noise reduction. You know, if you can only get a switch mode, that's fine. You know, it's still better than nothing, but you may find you get noise from the power supply itself. What I want to talk about is the whole linear power supply section. So, so we've got AC coming in, which is through a transformer. All right, and then we've got the secondary side on transformer coming out. Right, so that could be 120 volts AC or 240 volts AC or whatever, whatever your country uses. Then you can have an output from that, which will also be AC. There's different ways of doing this, but I'm just going to do a simplified transformer like this. This could be, say, 20 volts AC, for example, right? Nice convenient voltage. Maybe more, maybe less. We're just going to work with 20 volts. Something which should always be in there is a fuse. You should always have a fuse straight after the transformer and before the bridge rectifier. So we're going to now draw a bridge rectifier. So we need to do this. Full bridge rectifier, don't do this half bridge rubbish. I've got to make sure it draws correctly because, you know, I look like an idiot otherwise. <laughs> so what this bridge rectifier gives us, that gives us the AC to DC conversion. Kind of. I talked about this previously in an earlier video where you've got the humped waveforms, right? So you end up with a humped AC. So like AC at this point here, here and here, are both going to be a sine wave, right? At this point here and here, which come off, bit of a dying pin, these two points here, this will be a humped sine wave like this, right? So that is a zero point. And that's zero point. So AC goes plus and minus above and below the zero volt reference. And the DC one is only on one side of that, so it's always above zero volt. Because this becomes a zero volt reference, this side here. One thing to consider is that when you convert from AC to DC, because you're talking about peak to peak AC with RMS DC when it comes out the other side. But we'll get to that once we actually do the rectification. So then you've got, at this point usually, you could even have a second fuse, it's possible. Um, and in fact, there's no harm in putting a second fuse in. Let's do it. No harm in having two fuses. In fact, you could say it's a good idea because you help protect your bridge rectifier if something upstream goes. So I'll do the second fuse here. This pin's dying. <laughs> Happens in every video, it seems. Right, new pin. Now we've got a fuse here. Let's, let's say one amp there, one amp here, for example, argument's sake. It doesn't really matter. It depends on what you need. So then at this point, you have a capacitor. This will be a electrolytic cap. It could be, I don't know, 4,700 microfarad, but it has to be of adequate voltage. So in this case, it's 20 volts, a uh, 20 volt supply here. The 20 volts coming through. We're going to smooth it out. So we're probably going to want at least a 35 volt cap. So we can actually do that maths in a second. We'll work that out. So what we're going to do now, this will come across, and then we actually get to the regulator part where we actually do the voltage control. This currently is unregulated, it's known as unregulated supply. So to calculate this voltage that we're going to be getting at this point here, it's actually relatively straightforward. Now we've got 20 volts AC coming in, which is this peak-to-peak -peak waveform. Now we've actually halved that voltage by folding it over. So that's now 10 volts peak-to-peak, -peak, but not obviously RMS, right? To convert peak-to-peak to RMS, you divide it by 0 
So if we do that conversion to 0.707, that will give us a voltage over here. There's also a bit of maths involved here. I'm going to write it out. Equals volts peak to peak divided by, we'll square root of 2. Square that of 2, then you're going to get the RMS as well. That's the other bit of maths behind it. But I'm, this isn't what I do. I don't do maths like this normally. That's just another way of doing it. So I'm going to explain this a bit better. So how I would work this out myself is I would actually just do 0 0.707 of that. All right, so we've got 20 volts AC coming in. Let's get my calculator. Where's my calculator? So we've got 20 volts AC. If I divide that by 0.707, that gives me 28.28 in theory at this point RMS. All right, so I'm going to put this in here, 28.288. All right, there's plenty of precision for what we need. RMS at this point. Now, because we're going through this diode bridge, we're halving it. So we're flipping it over and effectively halving it. Oh, I should have left that on there, 0.288. Divide that by 2. That gives us 14.14 at this point here. But we've also got diode drops here. Don't forget the diodes, they're here causing a voltage drop. We folded it over and because we've gone through one diode each side, we've actually dropped by two diode drops. So that's about 1.2 volts minus 1.2. So that would give us here, at this point, approximately 12.9 volts. Maybe 13 volts, depending on the voltage drop, but usually it's slightly more. So I'm going to round it downwards. 0.6 volts is assuming silicon diodes, not shocky. If you shocky diodes, it would be a different drop. I'll assume silicon. So at this point here, we should be at about 12.9 volts. That's roughly what we'll get at that point. In fact, I'll also specify DC. So at this point, what will happen then, our waveform, because it's got this smoothing capacity here, which has obviously got positive polarity as well, electrolytic, it won't look like this anymore. Right, so after it's been rectified, if you ignore that part, it would look like this, okay? But once you put a capacitor in here, the waveform is going to look more like this. As you get a positive peak from the AC, it's going to bring it up slightly, and then as the capacitor discharges, it will ramp down slightly until the next peak. All right, so you're going to get a slight ripple in there. That's what you'll get. Usually that's fine before a voltage regulator. That's absolutely fine because it can handle that easily. It's not an issue. It doesn't affect it. Now I'm going to put in a basic drawing here, a voltage regulator. So I will actually do some overlays a bit later on as well, and maybe talk over them. I'm not quite sure. I might do a voiceover or something. This becomes here. We're going to make that ground at this point. So then we can simplify the circuit in this, we can say is, we'll call it, we'll just call it 13 volts out, right? That's quite typical to round up and down a little bit on, on your outputs. So we'll call that 13 volts out and ground. Over here I'm going to draw the voltage regular circuit, which is what we did last time, the last video. So in here we'd have 13 volts coming in, this is just the way I donate things, alright? So 13 volts DC, alright, DC, I should actually put capitals, not lowercase, but anyway. Um, and 0 volts coming in, 0 volts or ground. Right, zero volts. So these will be going to, in this case, we're going to use a 7805 regulator, which is what I've got sitting right here. I'm actually going to do a practical demonstration as well. And we shall bring this over into a box. 7805. And over here, I'm not going to put any capacitors on this, I'm just going to leave it as it is, and that'll be the output. And that's the output there of 5 volt DC. So a little ripple like this on the input to a voltage regulator is fine as long as it's above, well above the dropout voltage of the regulator. So as long as the voltage you're outputting, 5 volts, is, in this case, I think there's about 2 volts is stated to drop out, but I always use 3 volts for these things, give it plenty of headroom. So we need at least 8 volts of headroom below this ripple, and that will definitely be there. Okay, with 13 volts, you're going to get some ripple there, but it'll be fine. Um, if necessary, you change the capacitance values in this area here to get that ripple better. So we've got 5 volts DC, and that is 5 volts DC. Now, there's a few tricks to this too. Let's say you want more than 5 volts. Let's say you want 5.6 volts. This is a nice easy number to get to. A little trick with these regulators is you can actually put in a diode in the 0 volt reference leg. This is actually like a reference. This It's got an internal voltage reference built into the device and so it uses that to know what the voltage actually is on the circuit. You know, it, that could be whatever it is but it references against this with the voltage reference which is built into the device. You don't really need to know that but you need to know that we can make it do some other things. So if we want 5.6 volts instead, not 5 volts, because you want to allow for voltage drop across circuitry or long tracks or long wires or whatever, sometimes you want to boost it up very really slightly. Even if you wanted 5.3 volts, you could use a shock here instead. But I'm going to use silicon. The trick to this is you actually put a diode in here. Like that. Right, because then, instead of this 
point here being 0 volts, it's now 0 0.6 volts, which shifts this voltage up by 0 0.6 volts, well, plus 0.6 volts. That's the effect of that, which will give you the 5.6 volt DC. So if you've got a situation where your voltage regulator is maybe sagging slightly, because these do have a bit of a tolerance on them, they can actually be, I think it's about plus or minus 0.3 volts or something like that on these regulators, something like that. So you might actually find you're seeing a 4.7 volts and you want a bit more than that because it's a bit too low for your circuit. Chuck a shock key in there, that'll give you that 0.3 and get you back up to 5 volts. Or if you want to put a silicon in there, so it's going to be, as I'll give an example here, it'll give you 5.3 volts. So that's a little trick there as well. So that's something to bear in mind. It's a nice little thing to have in your arsenal of knowing that these regulators, if they are sagging slightly, you can shift them up by shoving a diode in series with the 0 volt input. And that just offsets everything by that amount. Similarly, you could use a Zener. Right, so I've just used a silicon diode in here. If you use a Zener, let's say uh, used a 5.1 volt Zener instead of a silicon diode, but, which you put in the opposite direction, by the way. Instead of being this way around, if you did a Zener, I'll redraw this so you can see it. A Zener would actually be located the other way around, right? So you go like that instead to your zero row. So if you put in a 5.1 volt Zener, that will then shift this voltage up by 5.1 volts. So that will give you 10.1 volts DC. Little tricks you should know. Also, don't forget to click like if you like the videos and subscribe if you're not already subscribed and click the bell icon so you get notified about the new videos I do. So I'm going to do a demonstration now just using some common parts. I'm not going to use an AC input, I'm just going to use a DC input for power supply. It works the same way once you've got that conversion done, which I've shown you. There's two demonstrations I want to do. One is to use a Zener regulator, right? So this is a Zener diode. I mentioned this previously as well in a diode video. Zener diode, you can use this to generate a kind of ballpark voltage easily. So I'm going to demonstrate that first. So let's clip this onto negative lead. We need to put a resistor on it, so we need a clip lead for that. I've got one here ready. So you have to put a resistor on the positive side. Well, it could be negative side too, but positive side's the way to go. Otherwise it will shift the negative voltage up. Depends on which way you're going. I'm assuming you're doing a positive regulation, right? Not negative regulation. If you're doing negative regulation, you have to reverse everything I'm talking about. So that's the positive side. Okay, so got negative on the negative side of the zener. Comes up through the clip lead to your positive side to this side here. So it's got positive feed through this resistor, which can be acting as a current limiter and voltage drop. You have to have a resistor on the positive side of the zener, just the way it works. So I'm going to turn my power supply on, which is currently set to 12 volts, and that's powered up. So stick some negative lead. Stick it over here. You see 12 volts right there. Let's stick it over here. We've got 5.01 volts. So that's a 5 volt zener being used to regulate voltage. So you can actually do it this way as well if you don't have much requirement, like really low current, because you're limited by what drops through the resistor. The more current you draw, it's going through the resistor. It's not being supplied by this, it's being supplied by the resistor. So that will limit your options a little bit. You can't do much current. This just drags it down and regulates a little bit to around that voltage. So that's that. I'm going to show you that same thing I talked about just now, where you boost the voltage up a little bit. I'm going to use this circuit first. So I've got a silicon diode right here. And as I said, you put it backwards. Because these are reverse bias, that's how they work, these zener diodes. But a silicon diode, you don't reverse bias it. Put it in backwards because you're referencing the negative rail. So I'm going to put it on the negative side. So the band is facing towards the negative in this case. Which is kind of opposite how you normally do them. But because it's a negative rail. So silicon diode through the zener to resistor. Now, what should we get? Bear in mind what we just talked about just here. So, negative rail, still got 12 volts coming in. What have we got here now? 5.6 volts. Because we're now dropping 0.6 volts across this diode here. 0.67 it is in this case. Alright, so 0.6 to 0.7 volts would be typical for a silicon diode. But it also changes the current. If I put more current through this, this voltage would actually increase. So it's not perfect, but it's good for very low current situations where you just want to give it a bit more. Alright, so again, just there at the base of the zener which was 0 volts before, we're now getting that 0.6. And over here, same place, 4.6, because it's the same as this. Right, and here we've still got 12 volts coming in. So you can use that on a zener. So if your zener voltage is a bit low, you can use a silicon diode to bring your voltage up very slightly. Or even a shock key as well, if you want a small change. So now I've got a TA7 out of 5, but it's all the same thing. 5 volt voltage regulator. So let's turn my power supply. I've got it hooked up. So the left pin is the input. The middle pin is the 0 volt reference and the right pin is the output. So if I go onto the 0 volt reference and the output pin just here, there we go, 
5 volts, right? And that's with no support circuitry whatsoever, that would be fine. So let's say we want slightly more voltage than that, let's say we want 5.6 volts like we did last time, did Zener. Let's reconfigure this circuit, let's turn the power off. We shall get a silicon diode, do exactly the same thing. Let's start with a silicon diode in series with a reservoir volt reference, turn the power supply back on. That's the zero volt rail there, output is now 5.6 volts. Exactly the same. Do the same thing with the Zener. Don't forget we've got a 5 volt Zener sitting there. So let's put the Zener in there. Don't forget this goes the other way around because it's a Zener. These are reverse biased. I didn't turn the power off this time, I left it on. Being lazy. Should never do that. Now we get 10 volts. See? See, if you only have a regulator which is too low a voltage for what your purpose is, say if you need a 10 volt power supply and you don't have a variable regulator to use, you can always use a 7 out of 5 with a Zener in series and there you go. 10 volts. Handy tricks to know. So now I'm going to put some overlays on the screen showing different kinds of topology for various linear regulators and linear power supplies. Okay, so I'm going to show a few different versions, show the whole yeah, with the transformers converting, and also some there which have got a um, step up current. So the 7.05 can do one amp, maybe 1.5 amps max, depending on the version of 7.05 and how good the heat sinking is. But generally, you say one amp and below. You don't want to push too much stress on these things. Now, if you need more current than that, you can actually use a pass transistor which takes most of the current. Um, there's different ways of doing this, you could use like an LM317 variable regulator and make a variable power supply, and then you've got a pass transistor which is used to pass all the current through, and the LM317 is used to regulate the voltage of that transistor, which is on the screen hopefully now, and that will give you a, a 5 amp limit I think it is. So I think the example I've got is a 3055 transistor which is I think it's a 5 amp uh, device, so that gives you a 5 amp variable power supply in theory. There's also other versions where you've got a linear regulator or even a diode. There's some here which show a 12 volt diode with a 3055 transistor and that is then giving you 11.4 volts on the output. That's another example I've got here. Again, in that case you want exactly 12 volts. You get that silicon diode, put it in that 0 volt reference point and lift that voltage up a little bit. So in this case you'd put it in between the Zener and 0 volt rail that lift up the whole voltage by 0.6 volts just like we did in the example I demonstrated. So if you found it interesting, don't forget to click like, subscribe if you're not already subscribed, and I'll catch you next video. Bye. Oh, I'm here now. Bye.